flux, EMF, induced currents, induced EMF, things that change, things that don't want to change, things that do want to change. Wow, how to keep track of all of this. In today's AP Live, we are going to dive in to Faraday's law and electromagnetic induction as part of our review for the APC e &M exam. So let's get started. So what will we learn today? Well, the first thing we're going to do is review a few things from some previous um, sessions. On April 21st, I think that was last Wednesday, I did not do a very good job of explaining how to find the distance between the capacitor plates on um, part FII here. And I wanted to explain that today. There are two good methods of doing this. Um, one method is to consider that our capacitors are two capacitors in series. Um, so the equivalent capacitance will simply be the capacitance of the initial one over two. So each capacitor has the same area, the same geometry, but the distance of separation will be half of the total distance minus the X. Um, if we combine this, we're going to find the D minus X is going to be equal to epsilon naught A over Q, the change in voltage. This A over Q is one over the charge density we found. And so we find that the, dins the distance um, between the two plates is the 0.02, which was the X distance at this point, 22 centimeters. And then we will add the new term. This one was... Um, had another method that was quite elegant as well. And in this case, you simply extended the best fit line until you reached the horizontal axis. And that's going to give you about 11 centimeters. I also on Wednesday failed to go over the point count for all of these. So I just wanted to briefly look at it. Um, the A portion was worth three points. One point was for the energy equation. One point was for a correct substitution. And then this one did have an answer point that needed to be correct. Um, the next section was worth three points. One point for the arrow going down in the top portion one point going down in the bottom portion and one point for being zero in the center. And then it was one point for ranking them and having the two um, top and bottom areas tied and then less field in the metal slab. Of course, it's zero in the metal slab. Um, these discussion questions, each portion was worth two points. Um, both were great, um, the answer greater than, and then a attempt at justification. You would not get that point if you did not try to justify it. Um, and then the second point was for a correct justification. And um, for the F part, the charge density, it was two points, one for correctly calculating the slope. Please remember um, to always use two points to calculate the slope. And um, then it was one point for relating the slope to the charge density and solving for the charge density. Um, yesterday, Ms. Messer um, did an excellent job of this derivation, but there was some confusion about this cosine theta. And if you'll recall, what happened here is the Y components from the wire on the left and the wire on the right are going to cancel because of the right hand rule. So we're only going to have the X component. And if we define theta as this angle between the horizontal and either of the magnetic fields, it would be plus theta or minus theta. Or you can say that it's this angle down here. Um, then the cosine of that angle is going to be y over the um, hypotenuse, which is simply the Pythagorean theorem of the two. I hope that clears up some of the confusion. 
As always, you can access resources um, with this QR code or with this link. Um, we will have a feedback form if you have any questions and more things are coming, exam tips and some um, AP dailies. So today, it's going to be the day of magnetic flux, Faraday's law, Lenz's law, forces involved due to changing magnetic flux. And we're going to practice some AP multiple choice questions and an AP free response question. So let's get started reviewing. All right, magnetic flux, very similar to electric flux. Um, it is going to be the dot product. If you recall, the dot product is a scalar product of two vectors, and it's the product that wants the two vectors to be parallel. We want the portions of the magnetic field and the area vector that are parallel. Um, you can often simplify it with just the scalar values of the magnetic field and the area with the cosine of the angle between them. And I have drawn that angle over here for us. Um, remember that the area vector is always perpendicular to that surface. Um, and so it um, is drawn. An important relationship conceptually is that the magnetic flux around a closed surface is always zero. If you recall Gauss's law for electric field said that um, had this and the um, electric flux was equal to Q inside over epsilon naught because you could have a single charge. We cannot have a magnetic monopole. Therefore, the flux around a closed surface is always going to be zero. You're always going to have a north and a south pole in any surface. The unit for magnetic flux is the Weber. Okay, so now is where the fun begins. We can say that a changing flux induces an, EN, an EMF um, represented by E. And as you recall, an EMF is basically a voltage. So we're going to combine that with Ohm's law and say it can also induce a current. Um, one thing that's not on the equation sheet to remember is in this case, there are four turns. This um, wire wraps around four times for this coil. So by flux would be four times just the area times the magnetic field. The direction of the induced current requires a right hand rule. And in this case, if we look in the hand on the left, you can see that I would wrap my hand, I put my thumb with the induced magnetic field and I would wrap my hand around the coils and that would tell me the direction of the current coming over the front of it. In the picture down here on the right, I see that my initial, magnetic field was into the coil, um, pointing into that south pole as we learned in our magnetism unit yesterday. So since the magnetic flux is increasing, then I'm going to need my induced magnetic field to go opposite my initial magnetic field. And in this case, uh, my thumb will point towards the left and my fingers are going to come over the front of that coil and that tells me the direction it will go. Um, I've included this picture up here so you can see that the positive, if we traced it out, did indicate with going forward over the coil. So however you do it, you're going to put your magnetic your thumb with the direction of the induced field and let your fingers show you the direction of the induced current. Lenz's law is the one that really determines our direction though. 
Lenz's law states that the direction of the current will always work to keep the magnetic flux constant. Um, this is a, the, um, always keeps the magnetic flux constant. So in this picture, I see that the magnetic field that the coil is entering is into the screen. Um, the flux is increasing because it started with no flux in that coil. And so it's moving into a magnetic field. So it's increasing the flux in that field. Um, therefore, the induced current wants to um, create a magnetic field that comes out of the screen so that the flux will stay constant and will not change. I can apply the right hand rule by either putting my thumb out of that coil towards me and seeing that my current goes counterclockwise, or you can put your fingers into that coil as the magnetic field, and you still see that that current goes counterclockwise. You're going to have, um, as shown in that picture. Um, the AP Daily um, video three will explain Lentz's law and how it can be used to find the direction of an induced current. All right, so we're going to look specifically at producing the EMF by changing the magnetic field. Um, and then we're gonna look at producing the EMF by changing the area. Those are the only two things that have to do with electric flux. So, um, in the case that the magnetic field in this picture is increasing, the, there was no flux inside the um, coil to begin with, and then it is increasing as that magnet moves towards the left into the field. Um, my EMF is the change in the magnetic field with respect to time times the area. So how fast it's changing is going to affect the magnitude of the induced EMF. And you can see in this situation, the induced EMF will be to the right and the current will be over the front of the coil um, because the flux is increasing and we want to go opposite the direction of the field. You would simply take the derivative of the magnetic field if you were given a formula and dot product that with the area. In this case, the area would be pi r squared and possibly times n because it had four coils. The next method is going to be um, by changing the area. And I have this rod moving on conductive rails in a region of a magnetic field. So my flux area is going to be this square right here. And um, I'm gonna know that my EMF is IR. Okay, so my flux is going to be the magnetic field times the area. Well, this is a constant magnetic field, okay? And it is going into the page. My area is simply going to be the length of the um, rod compared to the um, delta x of the um, movement, the horizontal distance. Well, when I look at what's changing and I take the derivative of this, my magnetic field and my length of the rod are staying constant, but I end up with um, the derivative of X with respect to time, which I'm sure you remember from kinematics is always the velocity. So I do recommend um, memorizing this equation for inducing EMF by changing the area. It is not on the equation sheet and it will be very useful in both multiple choice and free response. Um, this can be found derived um, on the AP Daily listed there in section 5.1, video two. All right, the direction there is going to be the right hand 
is going to go into the page because our flux is decreasing. So we want our magnetic field in the same direction as is shown. And then the thumb would go down with the current and we would have a clockwise rotation in that circle. Similarly, you could have done it the other way and you could have said that you wanted your magnetic field into the um, page. And you can see that again, that would give you a clockwise current through this um, square. Often we also will apply a force to it. I'm not going to go into it all here, but the electric, the uh, electromotive force EMF is equal to BLV. And then that current that's induced in that rod often creates a magnetic force that is going to slow down that velocity and eventually stop it. And this is well developed in videos five and six of those AP dailies. One other situation is going to be when you just have a conductor moving in a magnetic field. In this situation, little sections of the conductor create areas that the current can be applied. And so we are going to cut each section into a little piece dr, and we're going to integrate from zero to the length of this. So we're integrating the um, electromotive force, dA dt is what's changing. Okay, so my magnetic field is into the page and it is constant. Um, my velocity is not constant, but Omega, the angular velocity is constant, which is simply, um, the velocity is simply omega r. So if we substitute that in, we can get the EMF of a rod conducting bar moving in a magnetic field. This is an important picture to take a look at. Um, on the left at time t equals zero, we have a coil entering a magnetic field. The magnetic field is out of the page. And um, the flux is increasing, okay? Since the flux is increasing, we want to induce a magnetic field into the page. So we'll put our thumb into the page and wrap around the coil. And we can see that as it enters, it will be going clockwise. Um, it is going to um, be constant at T1 because there is no change in the flux at that point. And then at T2, as it exits, um, we're going to see that the magnetic flux is decreasing. So we're going to want our field out of the page, and we're going to want my, the current to go counterclockwise. On the force situation, it is always going to want to um, push against any change. And for this one, we would apply the right-hand rule, force is ILB. And we have the um, force, the magnetic field out of the page. And I had the current going clockwise. So that gives me a force to the left as it is entering. Similarly, because of the difference in the direction of the um, current, we're going to get a force to the left as it exits. One other thing we need to look at is the relationship between motors and generators. A motor is basically only due to a torque and a coil. And we have a magnetic field pointing to the right here. And on the left-hand side of that coil that's indicated by the red circle, my current is going up. So I would get a force into the page. 
on the right hand side, the current is going down because the current is going clockwise. And so the force will be out of the page. Um, the force is zero at the top and bottom. And you can look on daily video and it will talk about how to derive that net torque. But it turns out to be the number of turns times the current um, times the area cross product with the magnetic field. So let's look at a few questions. On question one, we are lowering a bar magnet at a constant speed. Um, through a loop of wire, and they would like to know which of the graphs is best. Okay, so let's think about this a little bit. We have the magnetic field, as you know, points um, out of the North Pole, and it, oh my goodness, that picture's wrong, out of the North Pole and into the South Pole. So the arrows on that South Pole should be inward. Um, so the magnetic field is going like this in continuous loops. Okay, so it is pointing down and the magnetic field is increasing. So the field was going down and it's increasing. So we're going to want an induced field that is opposite of the um, initial field. So that would be going up. And the current is then going to go counterclockwise through that loop. Um, this um, question said a positive current represents a counterclockwise current in the loop. So since it's going counterclockwise initially, we can say it's going to start positive. So we know A is a possibility, B is a possibility, D and E are not. OK, well, as it exits, as it comes down, then we're going to have a magnetic flux decreasing. So we're going to want our induced magnetic field to be down and our current will go clockwise at that point. And so it's going to be negative. So B is your correct answer. For our next one, we have two conductive loops with a wire running between them. And I encourage you to pause and work these on your own and then pick back up whenever you need more explanation or need to look at the answer. So this one would like to know the direction of the um, induced current in each of the loops. So there's several pieces of looking at this one. We know that um, the due to the current in the wire, okay, then um, there is a magnetic field out of the screen in the upper loop and into the screen in the lower loop. It said that um, the current in the wire is decreasing. So in both cases, the magnetic field is decreasing. So the current should produce a field out of the screen in the upper loop and into the screen in the lower loop. If we apply our right hand rule out of the um, screen in the upper loop, then you will see that it should move counterclockwise in loop X, the upper loop, and clockwise in loop Y, the lower loop. And so that would be answer A. Um, this is the same situation. Um, but now they are moving the um, wire up towards loop X. So it wants to know about the direction of the induced currents now. Well, we still have the same situation with initially um, the field out of the screen in loop X and into the screen in loop Y. 
But in loop X, the flux is increasing. Therefore, we're going to want to oppose. And so we're going to have to have a counterclockwise um, mo motion, um, current in loop X because the flux is increasing. In the lower loop, the flux was decreasing. So we want it to the magnetic field induced to go into the screen. And that will give us a clockwise. So there are both clockwise this time. And the um, correct answer is D. All right, we're gonna do a little calculus with the multiple choice here. Um, we are giving, given a magnetic field that is changing with time. And they would like to know the induced EMF um, at time t is equal to three seconds. And so this is a straight math problem. Remember, you're gonna need your calculator and your pencil and paper to do the multiple choice. It's not just look at the problem and be able to answer it. In this case, we know that the EMF is the negative derivative of the flux with respect to time. And we substitute our dB dt times A. We take the derivative of the magnetic field. And so that's gonna be 20 thirds. And we multiply that times the um, area and we get 10 volts. Remember this sign on the EMF is very much a reminder to look at the direction and a reminder of Lenz's law. It is not necessarily a mathematical sign. Um, you need to always look at the direction independent of the math. For question five, we're going the other direction with the mass. We have a magnetic field um, perpendicular to a plane of the wire loop, so we don't have to worry about the um, dot product. We know that the area vector and the magnetic field are parallel. But um, it changes with time in the region of the loop. If the induced EMF increases linearly with time, what about the magnetic field? So here, we're going to have to say that we know that the EMF was the derivative of the magnetic field with respect to time. If the EMF varies with time, then the derivative needed to vary with time squared and or no, the original one. The derivative varies with time then initially the magnetic field varied with time squared and the answer is B. Um, for this one, we have one that is changing areas and they are asking about the um, power supplied by the force that is pulling this rod along. So we have several pieces here. We have the EMF is the negative derivative of the flux with respect to time. Um, the EMF is um, negative BLV. That's a nice place to apply the equation that you remember. Um, the constant speed um, is going to tell us the force is ILB. And so we find that the current is E over R and E is BLV. So we've got BLV times BLV over R and we come up with the answer shown there. And if I look here, it's going to be D. Okay. Now, I really suggest here that you pause it a little bit, read the question, do the work, and then come back and see um, how to solve this. We again have a situation where the area is changing to create a induced current in 
um, a circle of a conductor. Um, this one is falling. And we are determining the magnetic flux um, through the loop when it's in the position shown. So the magnetic flux is going to be B0 times the area, which is the L times H0. And um, that is simply B L H0. Next, they would like us to find the direction of the current when this rod starts falling. Okay, so as the rod starts falling, the flux is decreasing. Because of that, we know that we're going to have to induce a current that is coming, going into the page. And so we put our thumb into the page and we can see that we have a clockwise current. And in that crossbar, it would be going from the left to the right. The scoring on this for part A was only one point for the correct answer. And part B, it was two points. One point for the correct arrow direction and one point for indicating the right hand rule in some way in your explanation or Lentz's law. For the C part, we now want to calculate the magnitude of the current in the crossbar as it falls um, with a speed of V. And this is pretty straightforward. The EMF is minus BLV and the current is BLV over R. Since it is a calculate, you do not have to start with the um, equations on the equation sheet, but I would recommend that you first write the EMF is the negative derivative of the magnetic field with respect to time and put in a couple steps like we put in on the earlier slide. This one was um, three points though. It was one point for recognizing the current was the um, electric potential over the resistance. And it was one point for recognizing the EMF was BLV. And it was one point for the correct answer. All right, the classic derive but do not solve a differential equation to determine the speed of the crossbar as a function of time. Okay, so for this, we are almost always going to start with a very fundamental relationship. So in this case, we know that the magnetic force is up and the gravitational force is down. That is what's causing our change. So we know that the magnetic force minus the weight is going to equal negative mass times acceleration because it's accelerating downward. Um, and so the, um, we substitute in for our magnetic force and it's gonna be ILB. And then we find that the um, induced current is BLV over R. So we can find that that magnetic force is the B squared L squared V um, minus the weight. And that's going to equal a negative mass DV DT. They wanted you to go on and rearrange this to find the dv dt equaling a quantity g minus the b squared l squared v over m over r. For the e part of this, you're simply going to say that the acceleration goes to zero. dv dt goes to zero. And so zero is g minus all of that stuff, and you solve for the velocity and there's the answer. So it was four points for part D. 
one point for the net force equation, the FB minus MG is MA, one point for finding the magnetic force, one point for substituting the current in, and a point for applying that acceleration is the derivative of velocity with respect to time. And it was two points for finding that terminal velocity, one point for recognizing the acceleration had to be zero, and one point for substituting. And this one ends with a question about if you're going to change something. So if the resistance of the crossbar increases, what happens to the terminal speed? Well, we know if the resistance increases, the current is going to decrease. So if the current decreases, we're going to have less magnetic force. We will have less force upward. Therefore, um, we will have less force opposing the gravitational force, and it will be pulled down more strongly and will have a greater terminal velocity. It was three points, 1.4 increases, and then you needed to say that the relationship between current and resistance, which if resistance is increased, the current will decrease. And one point for the conclusion caused less upward force to oppose the gravitational force. So what should we take away today? Well, on the equation sheet, we only have two formulas for this material. We have the magnetic flux is the integral of B dot dA, and we have Faraday's law. Um, you may want to memorize the EMF of a rod moving in a field to prepare for the exam. Thank you, and I hope that um, you'll join us back here tomorrow as we discuss inductance.